everybody, it's G Martz, and welcome back to another episode of the Hartford Small Biz Ahead. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're listening or you're watching. Today, I am here with Stephanie Stuckey. Stephanie is the chair of Stuckey's Corporation. Come on, guys. You have heard of Stuckey's, right? I mean, you know, it's a generational thing, I guess. I grew up with Stuckey's. I'm familiar with the brand. I've eaten many, many Stuckey's products over the years in rest stops and gas stations yeah. and food markets around the country. And uh, it's just, it's one of these iconic brands. And, uh, you know, like any company that's been around for a long time, I think 85 years, something like that, there's been ups and downs. I want to hear the story. So first of all, uh, Stephanie, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So uh, so first of all, let, let's get the whole story, okay? You are a Stuckey. So are, you're the granddaughter of the founder of the company? Am I getting the whole family? That's right. I'm the granddaughter. Okay. One of them. So so walk me through, like, first of all, how, how did you wind up as, as chair of the corporation? And you can go all the way back to 1937 if you want to, to begin the story. You know, I'll just go back three years. Okay. I had a career as an attorney and focused on environmental advocacy. I was a state representative for 14 years here in Georgia, and I was also head of sustainability for City of Atlanta, in addition to working as an adjunct professor of law at the University of Georgia. So I had this whole career lined up for me, and I think this is what hopefully will resonate with your audience, is that it's never too late to pivot with your career. And if an opportunity arises, sometimes you should really go for it, even if it is a complete 180 degree turn from where you were. And that's exactly what happened to me. It was November 2019, which all of us will remember soon became a very crazy time for our country and for our businesses with COVID. Sure. But I really got a call one day from one of the partners who owned Stuckey's at the time and said, the business is for sale. Do you want to buy it? And I had zero background with the company. A very, very quick thumbnail history of what had happened. My grandfather built the company from a roadside pecan stand in the middle of Georgia to at its peak over 360 stores in 40 states and really was synonymous with the road trip. We were the first yep. roadside retail chain, but he sold it. There were decades of outside corporate ownership and the brand was trash. It was six figures in debt. And that's when I was presented with this completely unexpected opportunity to buy the company back. So you had no involvement with the company over, you know, over these years. Was, was there anybody else from the family involved at that point? Were there any no. stuff that were working? Well, I don't want to get too bogged down into history because I think it's more important to talk about Fair how enough. we're moving the brand forward, but just very high level after several corporate owners, my father and a group of his business partners got the company back. At that point, uh, there was a lot of litigation involved and real estate was being unloaded. It was a hot and mess. And my, they had a bunch of corporations that they owned at the time. Right. And Stuckey's was just one of a portfolio and they focused on the brands that were more pop profitable. Right. As I said with a lot of respect and admiration for that whole team, which obviously included my father. But they had sold their main company and the remaining assets, which included Stuckey's. Um, Stuckey's was not profitable. They had all retired and there had been a decade of them being retired with right. a very skeleton crew and the company just at the, the last few years, really taking a note dive. It gets, you know, like any business that's been around that long, you're, you're going to have sort of a messy, complicated history, but very big picture. They've just been, a, it, it, it was it was a series of outside corporate owners that led it to where it had been. When I, so, um, how about as a kid? I mean, did you, did you have any experience yourself with the business? Did you work there as a kid, uh, as a no. summer bob or anything like no. that? Nothing about, you know, the, 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 the business itself, manufacturing food, which is really what you're doing. Um, I mean, the only connection was you shared the name. Is that is that a correct statement? Yeah, we road trip like every other family in the 60s and the 70s. Yep. And we pulled over at Stuckey's and certainly it had our family name on there. And I knew my grandfather. I was 12 when he passed away. Right. So I had this emotional connection to him, but I never had this. <laughs> 
notion that someday this pecan law roll empire will all be mine, right? It wasn't yep. our company anymore. And so it was just, it was, I had an emotional connection to it, but never thought I would someday be running it. So in that respect, we are your atypical family business because it fell out of our family. Right. Understood. Yeah. Um, how often do you get the chance to buy your family back. back? It just which I assume really it, ever happens. Yeah. Which, which it, I assume is, um, I mean, that's the story, right? If you're going to turn a company yeah. around and you're going to you know, brand it or rebrand it as it is, um, the story of the granddaughter of the owner coming back, same last name and taking over the company and, you know, going to, you know, going to bring it back to its former glory. Um, that's, I, I'm assuming that's was the attractiveness, not only for you, but also for, uh, you know, the, the current owners of the company to sell it to you. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. And, and I think it's really important to stress that that emotional connection is really important. So yep. whether you have a family business is very rare that someone's going to have the opportunity that was presented to me just like this, but the fact that you have to have this emotional connection to a brand and then you have to figure out how do you parlay that emotional connection, that internal passion that you feel externally to customers, to your team, to the vendors you work with. That's, to me, how we've managed to grow the brand. And we have. We've, we've gone in 38 months from $2 million to $14 million in sales. And- it, it's all rooted in get that emotional connection. It's yeah. sometimes easier if it's a family brand is your name up there. Right. But it, it doesn't matter. And by the way, we have a, we have a guest to my cat. So <laughs> <Fine>. <laughs> apologies. I'm working from home today. I'm not it's at the very game. cool. I have a little ball that jumps into these kinds of uh, videos as well. So no problem. Yeah. So, so Stephanie also, um, you know, for me as a customer, um, knowing that, uh, I'm buying a product from a family-owned business where the family is still involved, and you know, again, again, the granddaughter is the chair of the company. That that resonates pretty well with me as a you know as a customer. I like that. You know, it's a selling point, and we all you know sort of are romanticized by family-owned companies, and I think a lot of people support that. I, I guess my question is for you, and you know, it's important for our audience as well. You know, how did you convince your investors or backers or your financers? behind this deal. I mean, I can see if I'm your banker, I can see like, okay, Stephanie, you're yeah. you're awesome. You have a lot of great skills. You know, you're the granddaughter of, you know, the, the former owner of the company. Um, but you you yourself said, I mean, you, you, you know, you're a lawyer, you know, and a politician. Yeah. So I'm like, well, before I invest in you or give you my money, like, what do you know about, you know, running a manufacturing company that you know, with, with distribution around the country? How'd you, how, how'd you convince people to back you, given that you came into this with relatively little experience in the area. Yeah. An emotional connection is only going to take you so far. Yeah. The important thing with that emotional bond is that when times are really hard, that's what's going to keep you going. Sure. But hundred percent, you've got to put together the financial package if you're going to grow a company and you have to speak the language of business, which is understanding a balance sheet and an income statement and putting together sales projections that are rooted in data. And I lack those skills. So a couple of takeaways I would have for small businesses that are listening is one, and, and no disrespect if you happen to be a consultant, but if you are a small business on a limited budget like we were, or I was initially, it was basically me, I looked to free resources. I couldn't afford a consulting firm. So the Small Business Administration has resources. The University of Georgia and every state has a small business development center that is run through their public university system. So I went to the small business development center and they helped me put together a pitch deck and financial projections and make sense of our balance sheets in a way that could tell a story. So that's where I used my emotional aspect is, all right, how does the balance sheet reflect that story that we can really grow this company. So they worked with me, but this is the most important thing I did. So number one, take advantage of some free resources out there. Don't spend your money on consultants that you don't have, if you don't have the money for it. The second thing is build a team and surround yourself with smart people who fill in the gaps. So it took a while. It took me over a year of frankly, barely making ends meet 
And I kept searching for help and a partner and I met the perfect partner. So you have to figure out like what what is your strong skill and what is your gap and how can you complement that with someone else in a way that's going to be mutually beneficial. So I knew my gap was the financial acumen. And frankly, the company needed to be more profitable. And I knew my skill set was the brand, the emotional connection, and the ability to communicate, be the face of a brand. We had a great story. So I paired myself with a wonderful business partner. His name's Robert Gaynor Lamar. He goes by RG, RG Lamar, and he is a third generation pecan farmer. He had the knowledge. He knew how to run a business. He had a small pecan snack company and he was looking to scale by getting into manufacturing. And I said, well, I've got a brand. You've got the financial know-how. And together we merged our resources. And I'll I'll be honest, if you're a small business and you're a startup, you got to put skin in the game. So that's a second takeaway was build a team. Third takeaway is you're going to have to put your own assets in. So I my house is collateral. Everything I own is collateral. My life is collateral. I had to take out a life insurance policy, but we got a bank loan and we put together the financial reports and we convinced a small town community bank to invest in us with an SBA loan in rural America. And we bought a manufacturing plant and that's been the secret to our success. So let me recap, first of all. So yeah. you know, here you are, you're, you're, you're jumping into buying this company. Um, first of all, you leaned on a lot of the free resources that are out there that mm-hmm. not a lot of people know about. Um, and you're right, the Small Business Administration, they not only provide uh, help and counseling directly to businesses, but they have organizations like the Small Business Development Centers, which is under the SBA's arm. And they're at yes. most universities around the country. Yes. Um, also, I don't know, you know, there's other parts of the SBA, like SCORE, for example. There's, there's a lot of resources. Yeah. I'm a poster child for the SBA. Which I love. In fact, my local um, Small Business Development Center did a case study on us. I mean, we cannot say enough good things about them. And it's, it's interesting to hear about your experience with uh, the Small Business Development Center. Sometimes it's hit or miss. I have some clients that have had great experience with them, some, you know, not as much. Um, but if, if you're paired with the right person and, and if the SBDC yeah. connected with the university, like you said, at the University of Georgia, a lot of times um, the people that are helping you are, they're, they're you know, economics majors, they're grad yeah. students, they're professors, they want to get involved as well. So you really can find some some talent in that bunch. Top and notch. Free. It's you get free. some retirees who are sort of at the end of their career, have a wealth of experience. They still want to contribute. They still want to be engaged, which yep. was our experience. And it, I mean, we could not have afforded right. that level of expertise. Um, you also, I'm jumping over the team part because I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But, you know, you also got, you know, the finance that you needed. SBA loans. I'm assuming you got like a 7A loan from the SBA. Yeah, 7A loan. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, which again, for for those of you guys that are watching or listening, it is these are are loans at market interest rates. They're I think eighty or ninety percent guaranteed by the federal government. Yes, uh, they're they're given out through a network of banks. So you work with a community bank that I'm assuming yes. is a, an SBA lender, right? And um, so I won't I won't do a big asterisk to that though. It, like right. I mentioned earlier, it's great. It takes a, a while. It's a lot of paperwork. Yes, and it's personal collateral. Yeah. You so you, you have, have to put, put money up and, and collateral. Collateral. Yeah. yeah. So you got to be prepared to deal with that risk. And if you are super risk averse or your finances are not where you can do that, it's not the right loan vehicle for you. Um, interesting that you say that because first of all, you're absolutely right. And some people don't realize when they start up a business that they're going out for financing that whoever is going to be loaning or investing into your company that, you know, they expect to see you put skin in the game. Like, why Why would they be risking all of their, you know, assets if you're not going to be doing the same? So uh, that comes as that, that comes as no surprise to me either. And it's great to hear that you did that. Did you do um, both of those things, the advice that you got from Small Business Development Center, setting up the loans off, did you do all of that after you bought the company or before? Like, in other words, yeah, did you do all of the I was clueless. You're close, right. I was clueless. I had no idea how to pull this company out of the ditch. Right. It took me a year to figure out, have you read Good to Great by Jim Collins? Yeah, I mean, I read it like three times and (laughs) he calls it the hedgehog 
figure out what your hedgehog is. And that is the intersection of what you're passionate about, what you're good at, and what you can make money at. So you figure out like, what's the intersection? And I had to let go of what was not working. So part of his model is once you figure all that out, then you've got to quit doing what what isn't your hedgehog, right? And so I realized our hedgehog was no longer the roadside retail chain. We couldn't make money at that. We didn't have the financial resources for it. There were only 13 of the original 368 stores still standing. We didn't own or operate any of them. Yeah. It was a franchise model, which has been converted today to a licensing. Right. And so we weren't, we weren't profitable with that model. And so I had to pivot and figure out, all right, with my business partner and with this manufacturing plant, we can make the most delicious con snacks in the world. Really, they're amazing. And I'm passionate about that. Pecans are the only snack nut native to this country. Georgia, where we live and where we're based, is the number one place in the entire world for pecan production. We provide a third of the Georgia, the nation and the world's pecan crop. And we can make money at it. Right. So that's what we're doing. Okay. I have so many questions for you because this is it's yeah. a, it's a fascinating story. So um, hats off to you for having the... Um, the self confidence to recognize what you're good at and what you're not great at, you know, and you're you you nailed it in the sense that people want to know about you and the company, your face, your name. It's a great story to tell. So you've got that experience, and obviously, it seems like you've got some background uh, through both your political and your legal experience of branding as well, and and licensing and understanding that world. But it was important to bring on a business partner, RG. Yeah. Well, I have a secret weapon. We got a third business partner after RG and I merged a year later. His name is Ted Wright. He wrote a book called Fizz Marketing. He has a firm called Fizz Marketing. I was just a huge fangirl of his book. It's a how-to on word-of-mouth marketing. And I read his book and I reached out to him. And it it took about uh, six months of us just having conversations for me to convince him to come over and be part of our team. Now, he still runs his company that's very successful, but he is one of our co-owners. There's three of us now, and he is the marketing expert. And he's coached me and trained me, and I, I think I had a, just some natural ability at that, but sure. it, it was raw and needed some education. Can I get <laughs> help me a lot with that? This, this actually, in all the years I've been talking to entrepreneurs and business owners. This is a really, first time I've heard this, this, well, I'm sorry, what was his name again? Ted Wright. Ted. So um, when you brought Ted in, um, did you bring him in as a, like, did, just uh, if you're, if you feel comfortable talking about this or not, I, did he get some equity in the company or did you bring him on as an employee or was he just a consultant? Like, what was the relationship? And I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you in a yeah. minute where I'm going with this. But I'm just well, it was of- gradual right. because I would say a corporate partnership is just as important as a real life partnership. Yeah. Yes. And I've I heard a quote and I don't remember who said it, but they compared corporate partnerships to marriages and they said only a marriage is easier to get out of. Right. <laughs> so so choose very wisely. Okay. And the reason, take well, your the time. Why I bring that up. The reason why I bring that up is because there are a um um I've never really heard of somebody who's like read a book that they loved yeah. and influenced them a lot. And we're like, you know what? For God's sake, I'm going to go out and talk to that author and yeah. see if an author wants to get involved. And I, you know, it's a, it's a genius move to make because there are so many talented people out there that, that are writing great books yeah. that would be open to working with companies, even on an equity, even to becoming an employee, even it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, you can work on arrangements. So I guess that that, that lesson is really, really um, important. To, but I would, if I can just add a yep. little context to that is yep. you don't just reach out to them, obviously, and say, yep. oh my God, I love your book. I'm a fangirl. Will you be my business partner, right? <laughs> so the initial was, I love your book. And you say very specific things to show that you actually read the book and took notes and it made a difference. So I reached out to him in that and said the reasons why I loved his book and said, can I have 20 minutes of your time? 
Right. Right. Make it easy. Do an easy ask. And he said, you know what? I love Stucky. So I, I feel like I started on third base because I had a pre-existing <laughs> brand that some people, and you said in the intro, were generational. And that We can get into that, but that's been one of our challenges is introducing the brand to new generations. But he knew the brand. He's older, not old, but, you know, of an oh. age that would remember <laughs> it. And so he said, you know what? I grew up stopping at Stucky's and my grand my grandfather loves Stucky's. And he said, come by my office for lunch. We do this thing once a month where we help a company that can't afford us. But my team likes to give back to the community and I'll give you a free brainstorming lunch session. And it was great. That session ended up lasting for two hours. And so the initial request is, can I just have, can I just have 20 minutes of your time? Right. Or even 15 minutes. And it, and then the second request, which took a while because I kept having conversations with him, but then I said, will you be on our board? And so we had this advisory you know, board and I said, can you be on our board? We can't afford to pay you anything, but we, we would love for you to be on our board. And he said, well, I'm not just going to be on your board because you want free marketing advice. And I said, well, I'll be honest. I'm asking you to be on the board because I want free marketing advice. <laughs> and he said, well, I appreciate your candor. <laughs> I took him, he came back to me and said, okay, I, I will do the board service. And then shortly after that, we negotiated him being an equity partner. It's a great idea. And by the way, yeah. you're mentioning of forming an advisory board is also a great idea and another topic for another time. Yeah, that's but awful. that's a way to bring people in who, it I it mean, is. we were clearly punching above our weight. Yeah. And so if you want to try to get some of those people roped in, say, well, I'd but, love for you to be on our advisory board. And sometimes people are really open to that. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, next question I have for you. Um, technical. I mean, you mentioned that you, you know, you, you, you bought and you you brought up this manufacturing plant. You're making, you know, great candy. Um, again, you're not a manufacturer. I mean, I, you know, you don't know. I don't know what you know about making stuck in candy. Right. I don't know what RG knows about doing that. He sounds like I know he's got like. He does. Know, so Actually, he he's really good at that. He had so a manufacturing plant. In other words, that's what, was that the main thing that he brought to your team was the, the technical side to make this great product, would you say? Uh, operations and financial know-how. Good. Okay. All right. And really good at execution. You you can't just have a bunch of visionaries on your team. You got to have some doers. And I'm a doer too, but I I like I like the visionary thing as well. So you just got to make sure that you're ba you have to be brutally honest with yourself about what your skill sets are. Right. And that doesn't mean that you abandon things that you're not good at because maybe reading financial statements isn't my strongest point, but you can't be involved with the business at the level I am and not have a basic understanding of how to read financial statements. Right. So yes, he, he is now our chief executive officer. We recently made that move because I wanted to make sure he was being recognized for the contributions he was making. And I'm the chair, which is we're equals in running the company, but I'm the external facing brand ambassador. I do the speeches, I do the marketing, I you do a lot of the pitches for the sales, but then we have an amazing sales director who really manages the sales. And right. she's the secret sauce to all that. Her name's Arlene Paquette. She's amazing. You built a great team and um that's been important, you know, to do. Um so uh, you know as we, I, I want to make sure we have enough time. I have so many questions for you, but Stephanie, as we're sitting here right now, like we're in early fall 2023 having this conversation and as transparent as you'd like to be, I'd love to know what your top two or three issues are on your mind. Like what's keeping you awake at night right now with the business and share with us and you can consider this to be a public therapy session, um, what you're hurt. What you're doing, you know, to you know, to address these issues. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not going to say you have all the answers, and I'm not going to say you figured yeah. it all out or whatever. But you know, as you're driving around to work today, you've got some headaches on your mind, and I'm sure you're formulating, okay, well, this is what my plan is going to be to deal with this. So, for other business owners that are out there watching this or listening to this that have similar issues, and I bet you we do, 
I think we're yeah. all curious to hear like what you know what those issues are, what you're thinking about, you know, how you're addressing them. You want to share some of that? Yeah, I'm just going to share one, which is our main issue, and I think it's one that most business owners face. Hopefully, it's a good problem to face because it means that you're successful, and that's scaling. Okay. We by that in Stucky's world and and what you're doing about that. Yeah, we've exceeded our ability to produce. Our sales have been crazy good. And we, we've got to be able to meet the demand. So what are you we gonna do? are in the process of putting together our expansion plan. Actually, we, we are in the process of expanding. And it, it took a lot of strategizing to figure out how we could do that within our current capacity. And when you scale, you have to figure out, all right, so what's your access to capital? Right. You can either grow organically the old fashioned way and just continue to grow with sales, which takes a long time if you're yep. looking at manufacturing and we're talking millions of dollars yep. to expand our production. Right. So you, that uh, that would take a few years and, and we're, away we're ready to now. sell now. Right. right. We got the right. we got the accounts lined up. We want to we want to strike while the iron's hot. So there's that you could sell more equity. Right. Okay. And there's all sorts of options. You want private investors? You want, yeah, do you want to do private equity? Do you want to do venture capital? Do you want to have angel investors? So what what do you want to do a crowdfunding? Like, trust me, we've looked at all those different options. And all those have risk of losing control. And sure. or do you wanna do you wanna take out a, a loan? Do you right. wanna use some sort of loan vehicle? And and then in the loan category, are you looking at a bank? a private financial institution, or are you looking at some sort of government program? Right. So for us, it's been a, a diversified mix of, of putting together that capital stack. And we are in the process of getting a USDA loan for small businesses and rural communities for manufacturing. So knock on wood that we're waiting for the underwriter to get back to us on that. But we also got funding for our equipment with new market tax credits. Okay. And I am by no means an expert on that. We had an outside consultant. And in this case, we did get a consultant. Pete Byford is his name. He's absolutely amazing. And it's so complicated. I highly encourage folks, if you're looking at a new market tax credit, first of all, Google it and really try to understand it. But if you're in a set on that qualifies, it's a good way to get access to capital. And we got um, we got some real money through that and it financed our equipment. Let me, if I could, if I could just delve into this just, just very quickly, um, on the financing side, so you yeah. got USDA loans. So a lot of businesses don't realize that besides the SBA, there are other government oh, yeah. agencies oh, yeah. and departments that have loan programs. So on the USDA side, I'm kind of curious, how'd you find that program? The internet. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm oh, telling you, there are so many resources out there that weren't available to my grandfather in 1937 when he was yep. standing on the side of the road starting Stuckies. I cannot tell you how many hours in the evening I'm watching YouTube videos and reading books. I read uh, Reed Matthews. I hope I got his last. No, Reed Hoffman. I'm sorry, Reed Hoffman. Yeah, yeah. yeah Netflix and among many, many and other. And founder of Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so many businesses that that man founded. He wrote a book called uh, uh, oh, Wait, it was oh gosh, it's a, it's on scaling. He wrote a book on scaling. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And. So so you're on the that internet. That was very, very helpful. Read hop. I'll remember it in a minute. It'll come to me. That's okay. So you're on the internet. You're yeah. reading, you know, obviously Read reading books. books. There's a lot of self-research that you were doing, but you were focusing a lot of on the research. fact that the government does offer this. And also um, the new market tax credits as well. This is also a government funded thing where there is a refundable tax credit you can get for making investments in certain areas. And uh, we won't go into details yeah. on that. I get it. through the IRS. Yep. It is an IRS. <laughs> So when you think about this, which is fascinating to me as well, Stephanie, is that um, a lot of the funding that you've gotten from your business, you either got guaranteed federal loans through the Small Business Administration yes. as well, free advice. And now you're also getting loans from the USDA, another government agency. You're getting tax credits that are issued from the IRS. These are refundable credits that are being used to plow back into the business. Uh -huh. 
So, you know, the takeaway there is like, if you're looking for financing for your business, particularly if you're looking to scale your business, um, yeah. th there's a lot of available capital right, right from the government itself before you have to go to a traditional bank. And before I let you go, I just, I have to also ask you, you, you mentioned that you are evaluating potentially banking, you know, getting a loan there. We won't talk about equity choices you have. Um, wh what do you perceive the, 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 the credit market to be like now? I mean, the prime rate, as we're talking right yeah, now, is it's hard. Expensive. It's hard. So, is it an, is that is that a non-starter for you, or is it just one where you're going to have to tread very carefully if you go for financing from tread you carefully? Know, right. And sometimes you get locked in at these rates, so you you really do have to tread carefully. And that's where you look at these other options. Like we are 100 percent trying to drive more sales, and so. Let me give a shameless plug. If you are listening and you need a corporate gift program, please consider Stuckies because you can help us with our growth. So we are looking at heavily driving sales. And Good. then we might, we have a couple of team members who are very involved with the company already. So we're, you know, if we do any more equity investors, it would be very strategic. It's people we have relationships with who are in it for the long haul. So I'd also advise if you are looking to go the equity route, be very thoughtful on what your intentions are. Do you want someone who's going to pull out in four to six years and look for a very specific ROI, in which case maybe p private equity is the route for you because there is money in private equity now and offices, family offices are looking to invest. Or do you want someone who's a long-term partner who's going to bring other skill sets to the table? And so then you might look more like the angel investor route is what I refer to them as. Fair enough. Stephanie Stuckey is the chair of Stuckey's Corporation. Stephanie, uh, first of all, you met, you mentioned earlier that you, uh, you know, Stuckey's has a, a great brand recognition among an older generation. I'm 58, so I remember Stucky. Yeah, so was, we're almost uh, the same age. I'm right, right behind you. I got a birthday the, in a couple months. I'll be there. Trying to penetrate that that younger market, and I and I think yeah. that that's something that's really doable. And that's a whole other conversation we can have at another time. Like, how do you market to millennials and Gen Zs? Get, whole to get this. other conversation. Yeah, it's a and it would be a fun. And conversation. there's a lot of data out there on it too. There is, and then, there are a lot of options to do if you spend your money the right way. But uh, we're out of time. Uh, you've been awesome. So thank you so much for joining us. This is a great uh, conversation. Uh, hang on while I do my exit. And then, oh, Can I uh, just say real quickly how people can reach can me? Yes. Please go to our website, stuckies.com. Follow me on LinkedIn. I cannot follow back, unfortunately. I've, I've maxed out, but message me on LinkedIn. I do get messages. Or you can message me via our website or find me on all the other socials at, at stuckiestock. And Stephanie, do you have a favorite Stuckey's product to recommend? Our pecan snacks. They are absolutely addictive. So we do a kettle glaze, sea salt, honey roasted, and maple. You can find them at retailers all over the country, which is how we're, we're really elevating the brand. So pull over at Travel Centers of America or Wawa if you're in Florida. Pilot, select pilot locations, Murphy USA, Mapco, and you'll find our snacks. And I just love taking road trips and snacking on the kettle glazed. That's my favorite. Not only are we about the same age, but we have the same tastes and likes. So thank you. Yeah. Well, it's candy and the pecan snacks are just fantastic. Again, thanks so much, Stephanie. Everyone, you've been thank watching you. and we're listening to the Hartford Small Biz Ed podcast. And if you have any need any advice or help or tips on running your business, please visit us at smallbizahead.com or sba.thehartford.com. My name is G Marks. Thanks for being here. We'll be back to you next week with another episode with another great guest like Stephanie. Take care. We'll see you soon. Music